afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm Valerie Wade, and on behalf of the IFPDA board, I welcome all of you to the last day of the print fair and the second to the last program in what's been a really stellar combination of conversations and panel discussions. We're in for a great experience today with the program Ed Ruscha in conversation with Christophe Charix. It's an honor to introduce them, but before I would like to thank the people that organized the talk. Christophe Charix, Anna Tor Oak, assistant curator at MoMA, Mary Dean, manager of the Ed Ruscha Studio, Jenny Gibbs, executive director of the IPDA, and a special thank you to Ed Ruscha for his participation. Christophe Charix was appointed chief curator of drawings and prints in 2013. He has organized numerous exhibitions at MoMA, including Printout in 2012, Yoko Ono, One Woman Show, 1961 to 71 in 2015, and the current, not to be missed, retrospective, Ed Ruscha, Now Then, features over 200 works in a beautiful catalog. Ed Ruscha, is considered to be the most influential artist working today, and he has been the subject of many major exhibitions, including a drawing retrospective at the Whitney Museum in 2004, and in 1982, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art hosted his first museum retrospective titled, I Don't Want No Retrospective. Printmaking is important to Ruscha, and his first project at Crown Point Press was in 1982. In a 2006 video interview, I asked Ed why he liked the medium of etching. He spoke about his fondness for the plate mark impression, flat biting, and aqua tint, which are only found in the intaglio process. Then he went on to say, in true Ed Ruscha style, etchings have their own characteristics. An oboe sounds like an oboe, a guitar sounds like itself. Etchings are like themselves. Please join all of us at the IFPDA in welcoming Ed Bruchet and Christophe Charix. Thank you, Valerie, for those nice words. Thank you, Ed, for being with us today. And thank you all for joining us uh, for this conversation. As Valerie mentioned, the conversation takes place at the occasion of Ed's retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, which I had the pleasure to curate with Anna Tork, who is here, and Kiko Ebi. The exhibition tried to span the entire career of, of, of Ed, really starting in the late 50s up to last year in 2022. What really mattered to us from the very start was to bring together all the disciplines that Ed had embraced uh, over his long and prolific career. We felt it was key to really understand the way he thinks, the way a series of work develops into another one, how a media, medium leads to uh, an, another technique. So as you'll see in the show, paintings, drawings, photographs, all his books, a room immersive installation, if we can call it like that today, the chocolate room. And you'll see, of course, a lot of prints. Printmaking has been, I think, key to his practice from the very beginning. Rouché made prints throughout the last 60 years. And they play different roles, as maybe we'll talk a little bit about it within his work. Sometimes they announce another body of work. Think about the Hollywood print in the late 60s that we really lead in the mid-70s to the back of Hollywood. Sometimes there are more variations. Think about the standard station prints. They come here after a number of paintings, but they also offer a transition to other bodies of works. So I thought it would maybe be interesting to go through a few slides of the exhibition and to stop on some of the prints that you see intertwined within uh, other medium. So maybe we can start the, the PowerPoint. Or maybe I can do it even myself. <laughs> and well, here. this is about print, printing, right? So I, I just happened to think of the, about this um, Marx Brothers movie about 
uh, day at the races where there are uh, Chico Marx and Groucho are there and uh, Chico is selling uh, racing forms and breeders guides, these big books, and he offers one to uh, Groucho and Groucho says, how, how much is it? And he said, it's free. And so Groucho says, okay, I'll take one. And then uh, Chico says, well, that comes with a, with a $1 printing fee. <laughs> and, he said, and so Groucho says, I'll take one without the printing. <laughs> he says, I don't like printing anyway. <laughs> so it just kind of reminded me of the world of printing uh, uh, and that the, the mass world of printing has is, is kind of been threatened lately, but this uh, fine art printing is alive and well. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, before we, we look at a few slides, as how you got drawn to printed matter. It's kind of interesting looking a little bit at the way you, even your early job, uh, delivering newspaper, working for a printer, there is something that seems to print techniques, but also the printed matter itself seems to have been something appealing to you from the very start. Yeah, I had a job with a, a book printer named Saul Marx, who had his press in Los Angeles. I was lucky enough to, to work for this guy, and he had me doing all kinds of things, including setting type and um, cleaning books and things like that. He, he printed fine art books, and uh, so I got a little bit of a boost from that, and then at the same time I was in school, so I did etchings, things like that. Could you talk a bit about how school shaped also your understanding of those techniques? You went to Schwinnau and you studied art, but you also studied typography, design, posters, a number of skills that seems to you put at good use later on. Uh, they had silkscreen uh, uh, facilities there, and, uh, and I think they even had a few limestones that you could work on to make lithographs. And then there was an, an extensive uh, uh, etching opportunities for everybody. So that's how I got into it, all my friends got into it, and, and uh, it was like a challenge. And um, we did it just for the sport of it. <laughs> I can, how can I follow that? <laughs> So printmaking plays a role really early, as I mentioned, uh, within your work. And here you have a, a slide of the first gallery of the exhibition. Uh, and you see how Rocher really quickly get to the word painting. I think you are you know, really in your early 20s when you make those works. And one of the, I think, important exhibitions you are part of uh, around that time in 1962 is new paintings of common objects. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And you see in that slide, spam, the uh, actual size, the painting with the word spam, was one of the three paintings Ed included in that exhibition. But that exhibition also led to a number of prints, or related to prints. One of them is a poster. It's not in the show, but it's a catalog. It's in the collection of the, of, of the museum. And I thought it was so interesting to see you making a poster for a group show so early on. It made me think 10 years later of the Documenta Castle poster in 72 with the ants. But here, 10 years before, Walter Hobbs, the creator of the show, asked you to design the poster for what is today considered as the first pop exhibition in the United States. Could you bring us back a few seconds to that moment and how that came about? Well, this was 1962, and uh, um, it was uh, good circumstances because things were happening, and we, we knew Walter Hobbs, and he was at the Pasadena Art Museum where this exhibit was going to take place. And somehow we just, uh, it, things fell into place, and he said, let's, let's do a, a poster, and pointed at me and said, you're in the room here now, so why don't you do the poster? So I said, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew of a, um, a, a poster printer downtown, Majestic Poster Press. And um, 
they did circus posters, boxing posters, things like that, and I kind of like the the aesthetic of all that with wood type and all. And so we actually uh, designed this thing over the telephone. Is uh, it true that you gave say them all the printing and the, the name and the spelling and the names, all of that, and I just said make it loud. <laughs> and that's so they really they designed it. I just kicked it off <laughs> with three words. It was yeah. the time we're using very Thank short you, words also. And in relation to that show, Walter Hobbs published this portfolio of mimeograph. Uh, so this kind of very simple techniques, uh, stencil techniques. And you produce a mimeograph that relate to your very, some of your very er early prints that bears the address of this, your studio at the time, 33 to 27 Division Street. And you related to those prints as a sort of kitchen sink ID. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that print came about? Uh, I somehow there was a printer uh, named Joe Funk, who had a a little shop, and I mean really little, much smaller than this stage. And uh, he had uh, three or four limestones uh, in in his shop, and that's all he did was print. Uh, uh, lithographs, and um, so he said, "Well, I'm I'm for hire." He was right <laughs> next to uh, June Wayne, who was at the Tamarind. Yeah. He was in a little apartment right next door, so he was a, in a strange way, a competitor with her, <laughs> you know. And uh, so he said, "Well, for fifty dollars, we'll I I'll print an edition for you." So I thought, oh, "Okay, I'll do that." So. So that's how 3327 came about, and I was living at that address, and um, I just thought, um, you know, you make things come together with what's going on in your life, and it seemed like 3327 was a logical thing to do, and that car that's in there, that was the car I was driving at the time, and, and there was a collage elements and silly things all, you know, that's what I mean by kitchen sink. Bringing ideas together into, yeah. in, into one image. And, and stuff them into this. So in the, in the years that follow the, the, that exhibition, and you fer, you, you're going to uh, make what is today some of your two emblematic paintings, or standard station painting uh, on, on, the last, uh, on the left, uh, standard station, Amarillo, Texas, and on the right, send out station 10 cents being torn in half. And what people, and you see it in the context of the show in relation to books, uh, in cases you have every sunset, every building on the Sunset Street, but also 26 gasoline station. And what people sometimes don't know or don't realize is that those, that image came out of an artist book, that the artist book in a way preceded those very large paintings. Uh, and that book showed gasoline station that you encountered on the road. Could you tell us a bit more about, about that, how it came about, that small photograph came an offset reproduction in 26 gasoline station, and then two very monumental paintings? Um, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. And uh, when I lived in Oklahoma, who uh, worked at a gas station, and he was building his own house outside of the city. Uh, it, resembled, um, it resembled a gas station, and I thought, how great would this be to live in a gas station? And so these gas stations uh, began to appeal to me, and, and one in particular was in Amarillo, Texas, that was a standard station, and that sort of, like, evolved into what these paintings are like and um, how they're staged. And uh, that's really how they, how they came together. So I, I read that w w your first print showing that motif, uh, a, a standard station, uh, came about because a collector uh, saw you, these all these books, was drawn to it and visited your studio and saw those large painting and say, why don't we make a print out of those? Uh, 
Yes, that's what happened. And uh, there was a woman from uh, named Audrey Sable who lived in Pennsylvania. I had never met her, but she had seen this painting uh, and and offered to produce this thing. And I uh, so it became a silk screen print. And uh, one thing fell upon the other, and then that's how these prints got to be made. So how did you pick silk screen for that print? Because when you look at that, the one on the left here, the background is very different uh, than the painting. The light beams are gone, the magazine flying in the wind is also gone, and you have this kind of strange sky. Could you tell us a little bit about the backdrop seem to have played kind of an important role in that step towards screen printing? Uh, I think it, um, I, I had seen this technique before called a split fountain, and that's where you put two or th more colors into a fountain of a, a printer's fountain, which could be a silk screen or a lithography or whatever, and, um, and then it, it becomes squeegeed through the screen in a, a fusion sort of thing, so every background is a little different than the next. And I, I kind of like that, that the foreground image was, was static and, and fixed. The background varied from print to print. And uh, that I, I, I think that's how, the avenue I wanted to take. And what was the response of the collector? Because he asked mostly for a reproduction of the painting, and you gave him something else. Uh, well, I, it, it, um, let me think. I did the painting before I did the print. Yes. And, um, and so uh, it became two different images, three different images, actually, and um, four. Four. We only uh, have three here. Yeah, yeah, I have to go back in my history and see mm -hmm. what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that fascinated us when we just started look at, looking at this series is that you make that print in 66, and three years later, you reuse those screens to make more variation. And you see here in the print in the middle, it's not a flying comic book, but it's a little olive that flies in the, skin, in, in the sky. And the one uh, on my right uh, is, is a collaboration with Mason Williams. So could you talk about the playfulness of the medium where... You can swap an object for another one, sometimes collaborate with another artist. Uh, it, I was jumping from one thing to the next and, uh, and had these screens all set up and I thought, why, uh, why not do another issue of it? And uh, that was based on no strategy or anything, no uh, game plan. It, it was just fun to do and I had this printer, silk screen printer named Art Krebs. Mm -hmm who had a studio over on Sunset Boulevard, and he uh, printed a lot of things for the Walt Disney Company and um, for the opera and all that. And he, so he, was, he took this project on, and uh, over the years, it just developed into three or four different images. The last one, I had a, a, a number of prints left over, and then I thought, well, my, uh, my friend Mason Williams, I'll just give him these prints and let him add to this whatever he would. And, uh, and don't show me what you're doing until it's done. <laughs> and uh, so that's how, that's how that came to be. It's also a time where your work seems to be becoming increasingly experimental. You playing with mediums, with materials. Some of the word paintings become almost liquid. It's also a time that you say that I don't know if it's the right word, but painting f seems to be a little bit, becoming a little bit repetitive to you, a little bit boring, always the same thing happening. You say applying a skin to the canvas. Uh, and it's around the same moment that you're invited to a fellowship. You mentioned June Wayne and Tamarine lithography. Uh, and and for, th for those who don't know, Tamarine uh, is kind of one of those unique places that really match apprentice printers with all these uh, granted fellowship, uh, making works together. 
and, and inviting a number of artists. I mean, at the time, they invited Ken Price, Bankston, Moses, John Altoon, and you spend, I believe, two months there, and you're going to produce uh, over 22 lithograph. Uh, so what did that fellowship uh, teach you? How did you certain, certainly you, you, you spend maybe more time than you had ever in printmaking in a very concentrated way? Uh, well, I think the fellowship was for one month, I believe. You Half just go months. there for one month and go in every day and produce whatever you wish to produce. And with each image you were on, you would work with a different printer. So that was fun, I guess I'd say, to, to have that opportunity. And, uh, and some people would go in there, and they'd, in their one month time, they would make three prints or four prints. Billy Al Bankston went there and it did something like 30 or 40, I forget. And, uh, and I, I wasn't out to beat that record, but I, I ended up You almost up with, got there. I almost got there, but uh, so I, I, uh, I guess I liked it, and, and it was fun, so. so it's also the first time that you really spend more time with the medium of lithography. And of course, lithography is based on this repulsion of water and oil. So I thought it was kind of interesting in relation to the liquid words. And was this technique allow you to think about those words, those liquid words, differently through the very technique of lithography? Uh, I think it was uh, just an excursion into uh, illusion and uh, uh, fantasy notions and, and words and things like that. I mean, uh, and then I started looking at these words and then I thought, well, I don't know whether I'm doing images of words or with words. I don't know which, what I'm doing, <laughs> but they're fun to do. And, and, and you, 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 s you see how fun they are just looking at that slide. And just looking at it, I felt it was interesting how it shows the many echoes within your practice. You think of boiling blood and its relation to the use of your own blood, a couple, or about at the same time for a painting like evil or for stains. You think of, uh, I think it's hay, is it, is it hay up there and the, the earlier drawing that's in the show where it seems the page seems, the page, the sheet of paper seems to curl out when you read the, the, the word, or city that relates me to the painting today at the Art Institute of Chicago. So could you talk a little bit about how those, you have collection of materials, but you seem to have collection of words also that seems to appear and reappear within your, your practice. Well, they, these words would come to me in strange ways, sometimes uh, Ill, illogical ways, and I couldn't, attach a, 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 the selection of a word to anything that particularly happened in my life, but, but they just seemed like logical subject matter. And so <clears throat> um, that was really the basis of it. But let's say when you, when you painted a work like Annie, uh, as, as the word was poured in maple syrup, did you think about the first Annie you painted? How does that work just come back, but in a completely different way? Well, I, t I took the original one from the comics. Yes. And uh, I, I liked the way that was, that, that somebody invented these, uh, this sort of trademark image of Annie. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, then the, the bare bones of that image became something else, and I wanted to maybe step away from it and go in a different direction. So it's also a time where you're going to push a little bit, you, you, you're exploring, let's say, untraditional material like gunpowder, but you also start to use organic material. And you have on that slide the chocolate room, which is uh, part of the exhibition. And on the, but as you enter the chocolate room, you see a portfolio of prints that you published in London just a few months before being invited to the Venice Biennial. And here you have three of them, news, muse, pews. And, and I was looking at the, some kind of um, little brochure that you published at the time, and you talk about your experiment with uh, organic material. 
and you say something like, carnation did not pull, the paste separated from the liquid, certain brands of mustard turned out to dust, and chicory syrup similarly, a cream was not very satisfactory because it left a slimy deposit. So could you talk a little bit about how suddenly your studio became more like, really here, like more like a kitchen sink than, than usually uh, an artist studio? Um, so these prints came about from an invitation from a print shop in, uh, called Electo um, Workshop in London. And uh, I uh, set aside the time and, and went to London and sort of arrived at the doorstep there with no particular idea in mind, except that maybe I would try to um, print images without using ink and print it with uh, unconventional materials um, like um, caviar and axle grease, things like that. And chocolate was one of them. And uh, so the images I made, uh, I had to be kind of reasonably satisfied with what they, the kind of image that they would make. And I gave no real concern to uh, lastability or anything <laughs> like that. And, uh, but amazingly, they've, they've held up very well, as long as you keep them in a dark drawer. As long as you don't look at them, <laughs> they'll be fine. <laughs> they're okay as long as they're in a dark drawer. Don't bring them out into the sunlight. No, some of them even make it okay in the sunlight. Like I think salmon roe was a, a color that uh, uh, was sort of milky colored. And over the years, it's gotten more uh, deeper yellow. Mm -hmm. So it's even, I, I was amused by that because it was uh, even enhanced by uh, yeah. the time span. I, I love to have them next to the chocolate room because you, you see the colors of the chocolate room changing in real time, changing much faster. So those two works in relation to each other uh, are pretty striking. Could you say, say, talk also a little bit about the choice of words for that series? Uh, they seem to have been picked up down the road, or some are, seem to be very British words, like I didn't know what muse was. How much those words just come to you as you travel? Uh, yeah, the, um, I did six prints Six there. of them. Uh, news, muse, pews, bruise, stews, and dues. And so I felt like each one of these words was uh, connected to my visit to England. Like a, a tabloid country. Mm -hmm. uh, England was a tabloid country. Muse was this funny little alleyway in the, in the city. Mm -hmm. And news, muse, pews was like Westminster Cathedral the pews in a, in a church. Bruise was like stout and ale and, and beer that they love. <laughs> stews was like British stew, you know, cooking, <laughs> British cooking. And finally, uh, um, dues would be like unfair taxation and uh, <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. Yeah, and then the, the Venice Biennale uh, was really, uh, came out of that because it happened at the same time. And I, uh, I was there in, uh, in Venice and, uh, and they had a printer that was, they offered to, again, it was like an opportunity to do something. And uh, um, Henry Hopkins was the director of this, of the Biennale, and he had a printer there. They said, do what you wish to, with this printer. And so I thought, well, I'll just make almost like uh, building bricks or something, you know, multiples of the same image that could be hanged like, that could hang like shingles inside a room. So uh, that's the, the gist of how that came together. Someone dearly missed to the print community is Brooke Alexander. And Brooke told me that he worked with you, and you, you made him run around the city finding chocolates and paper in order to make that work. Yeah, Brooke Alexander was the late Brooke Alexander. Was, uh, I wouldn't have had, uh, had 
com I would not have completed this project without his participation. And uh, he right away jumped in and said, I'll help you do that. And so what we needed was many, many tubes of Nestle's chocolate. And we raided every department store, every market, everywhere, and went all over the city of Venice and got every last one of them. And I think we squeezed out the last little tube of that on the last image. <laughs> we were lucky. Let's move now to uh, maybe a decade, decade and a half later, uh, and just to see how suddenly Rocher adopts a much somber palette, you know, from what we have seen before, with those airbrush, often wordless painting called silhouette paintings. Uh, it's really a time when you start to focus on on objects that can be recognizable only through their outlines. And it's also the moment where you're going to, and you barely see it here on the right, this extraordinary print uh, published by Mixographia. And here we have a better slide, not only of the print we show, but of the full series. Uh, and Mixographia, as you know, is another uh, workshop print and publisher from, uh, from Los Angeles. Um, and they develop that kind of high relief technique. And you see this weed coming through the print seems to be almost like the real thing, like illusionistic at least. Could you talk a little bit about how that technique kind of led you to just a different vocabulary? Okay, here's another example of opportunity, and <laughs> it was happened to, I happened to be in maybe the right place at the right time, and, and I forgot where it started, but, and also I had, I had, a wor I had worked with the um, Aldo Kromelink, okay. who had a studio here in New York, and uh, I remember him visiting L.A., and uh, he had seen these prints there. He was very adept at, uh, and he printed for Picasso and all these other artists, and, and he was very um, uh, educated about the techniques of printing. And he looked at these prints and he said, and I told him they were, they were uh, made with one pass in the press instead of multiple passes with different colors. So it all came from one side and he looked at it and said, how did they make that? <laughs> That's a <laughs> like, Yeah, so he was fascinated. Anyway, this is a, a different form of printmaking that um, I liked. And could you talk a little bit about the use of wheat as, as a motif? Because that kind of goes through your work from the early 70s to, to very recently. You see this kind of wild grass or piece of wheat just coming through the, the paintings or the drawings. Yeah, I don't know what makes me want to use it, but it, it uh, you know, weeds represent um, um, age, aging or something, uh, uh, like your front uh, lawn would age with weeds and, uh, and actually using real three-dimensional weeds to make an image from uh, really appealed to me. They are, they are absolutely stunning. So let's move now to uh, closer to us, one of the last galleries of the show with those fabulous uh, mountain paintings. It, it's really a time when, when you go through the show that you feel that your relationship and the exploration you, 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 you take uh, on in, in, in the city of change, you're not really looking at the same things. For instance, here in Bliss Bucket, you're paying attention to this abandoned mattress uh, on the side of the road. So it seems like your relation to the city itself uh, is changing. And it's the time when you publish, when you're going to look at the city as, as, as a city maps. Uh, rather than buildings that you encounter driving uh, in Los Angeles and elsewhere. And that said is, 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 is particularly special. Its title is Los Francisco San Angeles. And in those soft ground engines, you jumble together streets of San Francisco of Los Angeles. So I'm uh, wondering if you could tell us a little bit why San Francisco and Los Angeles and what led you to the facts of bringing those two cities into single images. 
Well, I was, uh, I was at the Crown Point Press, San Francisco, and, and somehow I, I felt a, some kind of, I always, to myself, would say, San Francisco is the most beautiful city in the world. And I still feel that way, but when I'm there, I, have, I was overcome with the, with the city, and so I thought, well, this is, the imagery is going to come from that. And so the idea of just laying a map on top, I lived down below in the south of California, and, and so taking the north and lay it on top of the south, and there you have. And so that led this thing on. So you said something about those, those city map, and, and I, thought, I thought it was my chance for, to better understand what you meant. You said they almost look like what these streets might look like in the year 5000. Did I say that? You did. <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> like oh. In, in a way, the, these images. This image, uh, or let's say the city maps in general. Maps. Yeah, yeah. And then I did another series of things uh, that I call petro plots. Yes. Which uh, resembled uh, slabs of stone mm -hmm. that I met, made at the Mixographia. And uh, then they were overlaid with the images of streets of Los Angeles. And so it was just a, a way of nodding to the petroglyphs of mm -hmm. the world. It's also the time if you look at mountains or you use mountains as backdrop for your uh, words, uh, you also look at the desert. And here you have this beautiful airbrushed uh, mile inch uh, painting. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relation to the desert and more specifically in relation to the, the etching uh, that you made with Jacob Samuel in Santa Monica, those blank signs. And, and if I can, I'd like to make a pitch for another exhibition at the museum. If Ed has a retrospective on the sixth floor, Jacob Samuel has a survey uh, on the second floor. So please uh, go see it. It's really extraordinary to see Jacob's output in the last 25 years. And like you, he did a lot of work on the road, traveling to all his studio, bringing uh, portable aquatin box, making works with Abramovich and Kunalis and many others. So please check it out. But Ed, tell me more about those blank signs. Um, let's see, what are we looking at here? I'm not uh -huh. So it's basically uh, those small etching that show oh yes. uh, signs uh, silhouettes in the desert, of signs. but there's no yeah. word, there are no words on those signs. Yeah, I. I, I like the idea of uh, making, uh, working with signs. Somehow it, it has a, a click in my mind of, of the potential for subject matter to explore. And, and so I had taken a lot of photographs of signs on the highway. And um, one I think has many uh, signs. It's like a multiple sign. Uh, yes. array mm -hmm. in, that was from uh, uh, Nevada and uh, all these signs uh, represented different churches in the town of Parump, Nevada mm. and uh, it was it clicked with me and, uh, and then making a silhouette out of it uh, enhanced it even more for me so the, the idea of a blank sign somehow has a power for me. I think in, in a retrospective like the one we have, you start to notice how much an artist can be drawn to certain themes or motifs, and it's kind of striking to see that some of the first images of the show, the image, the photograph you take in Paris uh, uh, or in, throughout Europe uh, in 1961, you also focus to you know, empty uh, shop windows signs lost in the streets. Uh, how do you see that as something that can connect different decades of your work, just always going back to the absence of meaning, something that doesn't seem to carry uh, any meaning specifically? I don't know where to start with that one, but um, <laughs> I, 
you know, I always liked uh, the photographs of uh, Walker Evans and Robert Frank, and and uh, they seem to capture the uh, anxiety of of modern living, and I like that. I li I like the 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 sort of uh, bolts in a blender kind of idea that where things will come together and and signs and things like that representing modern times and activity and uh, I mean I'm certainly not alone in my thinking about that most artists are uh, very in tune with uh, the noise of modern life and how it can inspire you uh, and uh, you don't necessarily walk away from those things sometimes you have to address it in the form of making art out of it. Thank you, Ed. And I want to keep some time for questions from the audience. Just I'm sure you have questions for Ed in relation to what we discuss or, or anything else. Yes. Hi. Thanks for answering questions. Um, I was curious to know what you're thinking about right now in your practice and like where, what what things are really interesting? Are there any new words that are popping up? What direction are you heading in? Or, yeah, anything along you that line? You mean like really right now? I was really just thinking right about now, that please. bottle of water. <laughs> 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 and what I'm going to do with that. Uh, um, I seem to, my ideas seem to be like a variation on a theme that was started some years ago. And, and it got established in me so many years ago that I, forgot what the underpinnings of it was and what it was that got me to make art and you know think about things and so those those things started early on yes uh two questions one uh did you ever dream uh something that became your art, in other words, did you did you dream of a word or, a, or a, you know? Yes, yeah. Uh, I had a, a dream that I had to get up and write down in the middle of the night, or I'd forget it. And it was, it was this. Uh, he walks into a, a meeting hall full of workers and yells out, "What do you guys want, Pontiac Catalinas?" <laughs> that was my dream. The I painting have no is in the show. Connection to Pontiac Catalinas or to uh, uh, United Auto Workers or anything like that. So why would I have a dream like this? But I felt like this is important enough. It's so off the wall that why uh, I better write this down and make something out of it. And so uh, I, I've done works over the over the years that that come directly from being asleep in the middle of the night and then getting up and writing down word for word what it is and making something out of it. That's great. And the other question was, where did the idea of the olive in the standard station come from? Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I studied a little bit about music and I always loved that idea of a coda at the end of a, a musical piece where you have one little piano thing or something that would be a fine final thing like an uh, that almost aggravates the overall theme so it's a, something that uh, I use afterwards and it may seem crazy but uh, somehow pictorially it works yes so um, when you have a concept uh, before you make an artwork do you, let's say you come up with a word and then do you decide uh, you're gonna use canvas or paper or like how like does the process work when you decide a medium that you're gonna work on? Okay, so sometimes it, it makes no sense at all and there's no, no game plan. <laughs> I mean, I might start from, uh, from something that I wanna put down just like I, I I traveled to New Mexico and uh, and I observed the kind of art they were making in New Mexico and I came up with this thing 
psychedelic Indian guru, New Mexico fade-out photorealism. And so I made a work of that, and that was almost like a dream. Maybe a couple more questions. Um, good afternoon. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you were speaking about um, the serendipity of just m m meeting people in the print world or printers, uh, where you then took advantage uh, of the situation. And I, I think one of your very, very first prints, probably from the early 60s, was a print called Gas. And I'm wondering if that was a product of just you had a press in front of you and you could do something. Oh, yeah. And uh, so uh, I did. That's, that's it. I had a press in front of me and an opportunity. And so now I need an excuse to make an image. And so it would come, out, come about it in that way. And so the G-A-S seemed like a, a beautiful wiggly forms that made up a word. And that's how it came to be. And then I, uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to use the word there, I might, might as well put a gas can in there, too. So I <laughs> added a little gas can, almost like a coda. Maybe one more question. Can you tell us about the um, inspiration for every building on the Sunset Strip? Um, well, uh, yeah, that came out of uh, the urge to drive the uh, Sunset Boulevard, which was a mythical kind of street. I almost didn't believe in it, but then came to really love it, and, and uh, it's got bad parts and good parts, and, and I, I dreamt of uh, having a complete document of this street, which I didn't see existing anywhere. And so that's really how it got going. It was a, a photographic self-assignment that I took on to replicate and uh, photograph every uh, facade of every building on uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, thank you, the Print Fair. Thank you, Jenny Gibbs. Thank, thank you, you, Valerie. Thank you for thank having you. us.